Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. It's sadly all too common to hear homophobic and racist slurs inside every hockey dressing room across all levels. Former professional hockey player Brock McGillis knows this all too well. He came out as gay in 2016 after his retirement and since then has been on a mission to fight homophobia in hockey. McGillis provides inclusivity training for organizations while also encouraging and educating hockey influencers to humanize the two-spirit LGBTQ plus community to make the game a welcoming space. In 2022, the Hockey News recognized him as one of the 100 most influential people in hockey for his efforts to shift the conversation around sports and the 2S LGBTQ plus community. He is an international speaker and hosts a digital series with World of Wonder, the creator of RuPaul's Drag Race. Recently kicking off his Culture Shift tour, where he will visit 100 minor hockey teams in 100 days, his mission is to change the narrative from both inside and outside the locker room so that hockey can truly be for everyone. Please welcome Brock McGillis. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, Hockey Canada released a report at the end of 2022 regarding 900 documented and alleged incidents of on-ice discrimination why might this statistic be understated? I think players are really good at picking their spots because they know it's wrong. So they, and they know there's potential. It's, it's like a slash. If you're going to slash somebody, are you going to do it while the official is right beside you? Are you going to wait until you're skating up ice and nobody's paying attention because the puck's further ahead? Sort of like that. And beyond that, I I think there's a, on the on ice side, there's that aspect. And then off the ice, I don't think anyone is truly necessarily monitoring in the locker rooms and beyond players, coaches, et cetera. And also they're not penalizing for things that they don't hear. So for instance, if a player comes up or a coach says that my player was targeted with a homophobic or racist comment, the officials are going to say, well, I didn't hear it. Mm. And that isn't being addressed because if they don't hear it, there's no proof. And it's, you know, one person's word versus another. So I, I think it's a fraction of what's actually going on within the culture. Yeah. And it is really tough to fit into a new environment and for any new player in a locker room. But talk about if that player is 2SLGBTQ+. Plus. Hockey in particular, we're talking, you know, solely hockey, but sports in general, there's a ton of conformity within the cultures. Hockey is riddled with conformity. Players dress the same, talk the same, walk the same, act the same. I think it's because they spend seven days a week together throughout their youth. And then they move away for junior at young ages. And we're one of the only sports that ships our, our kids away to play hockey and when they move to these new communities they don't really have friends or folks outside of the sport that they engage with their friends are their 23 24 teammates so it reinforces the culture and they adhere to it more that said 
I think it leads to people not feeling like they can be anything other than the tropes or stereotypes of the culture. And that includes, but not only being LGBTQ+. You know, it, it could be as simple as enjoy reading or having, you know, watching movies or playing board games with their family or just having hobbies and things they love that are non-traditional or not the norm in the space that you talk about leads folks to hide. And I think a lot of people are closeted, not just queer players. Yeah. And the culture of hockey seems to grant organizations to happily shield internally known predators and at the same time ostracize their victims, yet turn around and announce they're taking steps to improve their culture. Then after promoting initiatives to make the game inclusive, they proceed to shun someone who is 2SLGBTQ+. Make this make sense. There is a lot of performative actions within the culture. I think it's partially due to the fact that a lot of the people who work in the culture, I, I think we're starting to see the little shifts in this aspect, but want to fix it themselves versus bringing people in to help. I think they don't have enough of a comprehension of the issues and how to properly engage with them. So they do simple things like a rainbow night, like a pride night or different things to show inclusion. And I haven't seen one rainbow eradicate homophobia yet. No. So, and they're terrified but, of rainbows, <laughs> some people. <laughs> but So to me, it's those are performative measures and they're acting as if those are shifting culture. Well, I look at, if, if we're talking about pride nights, I, I look at that and I think of pride and pride started in New York City as a protest and a fight for rights because at the time it was illegal to be gay. And even in the few years after it was decriminalized, police and different groups were still seeking out and attacking the community. And then into the eighties where the HIV AIDS epidemic started and it was a fight to get support and help when the government was letting um, community die and just almost it seemed like hoping they would die and they would kill off gays so to me pride was a final protest and as we've gained more rights and inclusion and some members of the community whether it's you know two-spirit folks or trans and non-binary folks are still ostracized and persecuted and a whole bunch of different things at, at higher levels than somebody like myself, a uh, white, cis, straight, yeah. passing gay man. Pride has turned into a bit of a celebration. We're doing that in sport, but we haven't given people the rights to exist within the sport, yet we've skipped all the steps and gone straight to the celebration. And to me, that's backwards. We should almost pause all of that and do the work to make the sport safe and equitable. And then at that point, we can celebrate. So, I mean, to me, it's a long way of saying, I think it's all performative. I think there's probably some good intentions, but we don't have rights or equality in the sport. We don't have, to your point, the, the ability to exist without yeah. fear of retribution for it. And yet we're having these nights and it almost feels very box ticky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the dressing room code of secrecy, how much does that play into the unwillingness for the entire hockey culture to change? I mean, players are programmed from young ages in a number of different ways. What's said in the room stays in the room is a big one from coaches, et cetera. And then on top of that, coaches are traditionally ex-players. 
they're reinforcing what's been taught to them. It's all learned behavior. And then the kids pick this up and then they start acting the same way. There's only really four things you can talk about in a boys or men's hockey locker room, women, video games, partying, and sports. <laughs> other than that, you might as well be gay. Like you're going to be othered if you're non-traditional. And, and we've seen it from NHL players right down to youth hockey players. So to me, the, the culture of the locker room has a massive impact. It, it, it is the determining factor. It is what allows or doesn't allow people to be themselves. And most people go through life wanting to be seen. But in the case of somebody who is 2SLGBTQ+, there is a need to protect oneself. How exhausting is it to hide your true identity, especially in such an intimate environment as a locker room? It's the worst thing I ever did. It was the most exhausting. I'm on a 100-day tour where I haven't slept in a month, and that was more exhausting. Hmm. Um, hiding who I was 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 I mean it almost killed me if I'm being honest uh I suppressed who I was and I adhered to the the tropes and the stereotypes of the culture as a survival mechanism and then by the time I was 18 I started drinking heavily to numb it from 18 to 23 I drank every single day to numb who I was so I wouldn't have to deal with it I started having season ending injuries, I think from 15 until I retired in my late twenties had a season ending injury every year. I was depressed. I wasn't sleeping. I was suicidal and I was drinking and it was all because of that. And then at 23, I was playing in Europe and I sat myself down one day and I said, you need to figure this out because I knew my career was going to end. I went from being on NHL draft list and supposed to have this trajectory potentially towards the NHL. And it was about to end. It derailed completely. And number two, and most importantly, if I didn't figure out who I was and I kept going down this destructive path, I would end up dead. Yeah. So I came back from that season and I went to Toronto and I went on a date with a guy. And initially I was so excited. I thought my life's going to get back on track. I'm going to make the NHL. Everything's going to go the way it was supposed to. But things got worse because now I was in the closet. Now I was hiding from everyone who I was. I started dating that man. I dated him for three years without a soul in my life knowing. Wow. Not a friend, not a family member, nobody. And we had a fake name, an alias that we used for me with his friends so that they wouldn't find me on social media figure out as a professional hockey player and potentially out me. That was a lot to, to go through and to deal with. And it was frankly exhausting. And, and I was, you know, um, it took a toll on me. And eventually I took a step back from pro hockey predominantly because of that when we broke up. And I moved to Montreal and I went to Concordia and, and played on the hockey team there. But I I needed to step away just to clear my mind because it was, I thought it was going to get better and it got worse. When did you personally start to feel accepted after you came out? Well. Or even before? My, uh, I have. So my family was always inclusive and supportive. The first time I asked my parents, what if I was gay? I was six. My family and my friends have been wonderful from the get-go. That's huge. It is. I'm very fortunate. It's not everyone else has that. I think when I came out publicly, I, I didn't know what would happen. But that first day, I received over 10,000 messages from people all over the world, including ex-teammates, including wow. I, I got a phone call from Brendan Shanahan and, and Kyle Dubas and other hockey folks and media members and different people. So uh, there was a lot of people who showed me support 
and thought that it was a good thing. Um, and it far outweighed any negative. So uh, how, who do, how do you know who to trust now? Because obviously, you know, there are some people that <laughs> are untrustworthy in this space. I've created a really strong, small network of people I truly trust. I, I have a larger network of people out there, of course, but um, those who I, I trust unconditionally, it's very small. Um, and it's intentional. I, I don't want to expand within the sport, my networks. And in terms of who I, I trust explicitly, there's, there's a lot of people I'll work with and engage with that are really good people. Um, but I've had to learn. I used to be a little naive and I used to trust. And that can be a little scary and a little daunting. And it could also um, not be great. So I had to learn to not trust so much and protect myself more. I have a very 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 small group of people that i trust unconditionally you touched on this um and i saw that the trevor report reported in just may 2023 that 41 percent of two-spirit lgbt plus youth have considered suicide in the past year and you know when you had your own dark moments, how you how did you really get through them and not, you know, do the yeah. thing? Yeah. And and even beyond that with the Trevor project, there's, you know, the amount of kids that are being kicked out of their homes and everything else is just heartbreaking in 2023 is pretty wild. Um, one night, do you know Sanaya Sapurji at all? Not personally, no. Okay, so Sanaya is a journalist. When I was in the OHL, she was covering the league for the Toronto Star, and then she went on to Yahoo Sports, and now I believe she's at the Athletic. And Sanaya, um, talked me out of dying one night. Oh, she saved my life. Um, I used to drive around trying to figure out where I would do it when I was in the OHL. Oh my God. I, it was, I, I was very close to death on a number of occasions and I, I don't know why I'm still here. Thankfully you are. I think, you know, there's a little divine intervention of some sort that, that has me here and a little more purpose for my life. And hopefully my experiences will help others not feel the way I felt. And hopefully the work I do can help save some people. <sighs> On a lighter note, or maybe not, what is the genesis of your 100-day culture shift tour? When did you come up with the idea? It's something that's been in my mind for, for a long time. There's a few things I'm in the process of working on right now that got either stalled or derailed because of the pandemic. I think my career was on a certain trajectory pre-pandemic and it just sort of crashed down after that and now I'm back able to do the things that I've wanted to do and and I wanted to do a tour like this whether it's with teams or at schools I want to do one like this at pride events in the summers 
I, w- I want to take it across. And it had been years in the making and, and it just finally all came together. And uh, fortunately for me, it did because it's what I've wanted to do. Um, I think I'm a bit of a masochist because uh, put yourself on the road for a hundred days, speaking to a hundred teams has been daunting. Um, I, if I yawn at all, I apologize. It has nothing to do with this conversation. It's just, I'm literally underslept and exhausted. And But in saying that, I wouldn't change it for the world because I mean, it's been the most remarkable experience of my life. What has the feedback been like? It's been incredible. I had um, a parent, a mother reached, sent me an email in, in Vancouver and one of her son's friends had heard me talk and he went over and he was telling the family that I changed the way he saw the world and he thinks I changed his life. Wow. And this 16 or 16 year old hockey boy. And I'm not, you know, and, and my main thing isn't, you know, you have to be this or you have to be that. Like, ultimately, it's their choice. They're going to be who they are, regardless of what I say. And I can't control if they're anti-LGBTQ plus or not, or any other group for that matter. But hopefully they recognize impact. And that's the ultimate goal is having them recognize the impact of their language, behaviors, attitudes, and and hearing that from that mother. And then she's like, can my son come and hear you? And I'm like, well, they're private. She's, so she set up an engagement with her son's team. And I went in with them. There was an incident in Calgary where a player experienced hate the weekend before. I came in on a Wednesday and it happened the weekend before. And he came up to me in tears after the session and he's 14 and he's like, you inspired me to tell my teammates how it made me feel. So I grabbed the coach and I said, listen, I'm coming back in. When's your next practice? He wants to share. I'm going to facilitate it. And then I went back on that, that Friday and, and helped facilitate for the young boy to share Wow. The impact that his friends had on him, the negative impact. Um, I've had five, six, seven people come out to me already, three stops, um, who are either struggling or not out fully in their lives, whether it's players or coaches. It's It's been tremendous. The, the response from parents has been incredible. Um, the the coaches and the teams have been great the players have been great i mean there's videos of 16 year old triple a hockey boys sitting around and talking to me for 45 minutes to an hour after the session ends and i'm like it's cool like we're creating a shift yeah and i'm sure if you go back to your days in the locker room um you probably felt like you were totally alone so this helps them not feel so alone oh 100 i i was alone i i i didn't have anyone to talk to i didn't have anyone to engage with even when i was you know struggling like nobody knew why i never once said it was because i was gay i hid that is there a safe environment set up like hockey inclusion might be evolving but you know and then the hockey is for everyone program just recently launched at the nhl inclusion coalition to include bipoc to slgbtq plus players and allies but are there any other support structures in place not just with the nhl but with the the other leagues I, I would say even if you look at that inclusion and listen, I think Kim Davis and her team are doing wonderful work, but there isn't one gay man on oh, that. Oh, really? They have queer women, yeah. but 
I mean, the being gay in men's hockey is a very different animal than, you know, being queer or gay in women's hockey. So not having anyone representing that community, I think is, is something that needs to happen at that um, particular spot. I think there isn't anyone at other levels. And even within that, like, I, I don't think a player is going to come out to a committee like that of current and former players and risk, yeah. you know, that it gets out and potentially fear of losing their career whether they would or wouldn't is irrelevant but it's the fear of that based off the language behaviors attitudes that exist so there isn't really anything in place anywhere wow so what can we all do to step up publicly and behind closed doors of the locker room to make this game safer for this community I think it's things we can do for all communities. Um, I talk about becoming a shift maker. I, I think most people are good by nature and we can all create shifts. And those shifts, big or small, have a ripple effect and an impact. And we'll never know the true impact of them, but it'll be far greater than we could ever imagine. Uh, the first time I realized that I could create shifts, I when I retired, I was working with athletes. I was doing off-ice training, on-ice skill development, working with about 100 players a day in Sudbury, Ontario. And I hid my sexuality from them um, for about five years because I didn't think up there that anyone would want to work with me. I came to find out through a few different things that happened that they all knew I was gay which was cool to find out. And I started to notice anytime they'd say something homophobic, they'd apologize. And I was trying to curb racist, sexist, homophobic, ableist language with my athletes. But I started thinking, cool, maybe we're creating a shift here. And then I thought, well, maybe they apologize to me, but they go to school or the rink or to parties or clubs and they're calling people slurs. Then one day I wasn't there and I had a sprint coach working with some athletes on a track. And at the end of the workout, he told them they had 10 more sprints and a younger player said, this is so gay, I can't believe you're making us do this. And a player who was already in the OHL about to go pro looked at the younger player and said, we don't say that here, give me 50 push-ups. And that became something my athletes adopted amongst themselves. All 100 of them started doing push-ups if they said something homophobic. And it was a way to hold themselves accountable to break the habits that they created in their language and also hold each other accountable. And because they're influencers, they took that to their friends they took it to school they took it to their teams and before i knew it people i didn't even know were doing push-ups because of that kid i realized i could create shifts he created a shift and if something he thought was so tiny and small just on a track in northern ontario canada you know what i mean but because of that i realized i could be a part of creating shifts and evolving culture because of him and allowing me to recognize that um, I've had thousands of people who've come to me for support and it's many cases potentially life-saving support I've been able to help them get in their areas or talk to their families and and be a resource and help guide them and that kid saved lives wow he'll never know the true impact he had but I think we can all be shift makers and we can all create shifts and I think there's three easy ways we can humanize issues when we put faces to something it becomes real as opposed to abstract arguments and thoughts i think the environment we create i believe that most people are good if not the vast majority of people are good and if they knew the impact they would evolve it so by humanizing it they'll recognize the impact and shifting their language and the language around them so i talk about five different types of language and then the third way is breaking down conformity in the culture and celebrating and, and embracing individuality and allowing people to be people and, and multidimensional, multifaceted beings versus being these hockey robots mm -hmm. that we currently have. And, you know, working in media, you've probably saw it every hockey interview sounds like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they dress the same, talk the same, walk the same. It's they've conformed yeah. and and they don't even realize it. So 
breaking down that conformity is key and celebrating individuality and recognizing that you can be an individual and still play for a team. People do it at work in, you know, in the real world every single day. So we can do that. And I, I think those three things are critical. And when we do them, we embrace who we are we will be less likely to judge others. Have you picked any cities for the American leg of your culture shift tour? Not yet. This one was just 100 teams in Canada. Next year, I want to do an American and a Canadian tour, two separate ones. So the odds are it'll be NHL cities in year one. Yeah. Whether we get to all of them or not, TBD. But I think that would be the goal in in the U.S. is is year one get to U.S. or NHL cities and then expand out from there, which is what we're doing in Canada for year one. We're going to the NHL all seven NHL cities, and then in year two and beyond, we'll get further east, uh, up north, different places, and to provinces and territories we've missed. So, but it had to start somewhere and, and these cities made the most sense to start in and get traction and visibility for it. And no, the, the stops in the U.S. haven't been discussed yet. Are you hopeful there might be a day when we no longer need to have these conversations? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, listen... T- this isn't what I anticipated doing with my life. I love it. I'm happy to do it. Um, but there's a lot of things I want to do and work outside of the sport. But I keep getting drawn back in because... This is important. And it hasn't evolved yet. And especially in Canada, hockey has such a major influence on our culture that, you know, if we can shift this culture, I think society will follow. Thank you so much, Brock. It was so much of an honor to have you on. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.